Welcome back to Education US Theory. Today we will explore how school with over 100 years of history repairs students for top university. Through strategic partnership and battle activities, we uncover the real qualities and the real intention that top university in the US are seeking for beyond academic performance or extracurricular projects. Are students merely ticking boxes or gaining a deeper sound understanding? This episode delves into the school approach, emphasizing a detailed step-by-step -step preparation from a variety of extracurriculars, including sports, acts, and even 25 AP programs to fostering sound confidence. The goal is to provide ample opportunities for talented and ambitious students to distinguish themselves or build up their self-confidence among massive applications to the top university. Join us, uh, Ms. Alex and Mr. Charlie, to share their wisdom on navigating this journey. So how do you think uh, with such kind of changes, how much it will impact on the education, especially on high school education? Yeah, there's, there's so many things that we are thinking about. I mean, one, thing, one way I hold this is that the most important thing we can do in the high school years is to help our students become more of themselves, to figure out who they are, what matters to them, what motivates them, what kind of friend they want to be. And so through that process of understanding themselves, they're really sharpening their focus on how they can serve the world beyond high school, mm -hmm. beyond college, beyond graduate school, and make a meaningful impact and live a good life. And there's lots of ways to define a good life, but we, we believe that it has to come from the inside first, rather than being about externalities like grades or a particular sports season performance. I mean, those things matter, but they're usually rooted in a child really knowing themselves. Very enlightening. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm just curious. So how the student will see the differences between that kind of approach with their imagination and with their mm -hmm. expectation, especially their parent expectation? Well, every parent that I've ever met wants their children to be happy and mm -hmm. successful. And I think if you look at each of those words, happy and successful, we could have a 10-hour conversation about what that means. But the way that I understand it in all my years of, I've been in, working in high schools for 25 years, what I have found is that parents, what they want the most is for their children to feel that who they are is unique and distinct and precious and that they should root in being who they are before they root in all those other things like where they went to college or how much money they're gonna make in life because those are the things you can't control as much but you can control and you can invest in who you're, you are first. But I wonder, when we use the word successful, is this a kind of stereotype? Mm. So do we have to live up to some definition about success? Mm. And how is it the barriers or is it uh, the limits to the freedom of being themselves and being happy if looking at the skid perspective? Well, we're very lucky here at Kate. Uh, in in my mind, if we have any student here at Kate is already successful. They mm -hmm. are all re they have what they need in life to succeed. They are their parents love and care about them. They have a hundred teachers around them who are invested in their growth, who are invested in helping them and helping them learn as much as they possibly can about the world. And so what I wish to say to families, I say this all the time is it's already going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Let's live as if your children are already successful because that's what I believe. And again, success either can be determined by external metrics or you get to define success for yourself. And this has worked for me personally in my own life. You know, I didn't wake up when I was 15 years old and say to myself, I'm going to be the head of Kate school or any, any school necessarily. I said, I know that I'm a good listener. I know that I love connecting with people. I know that I like helping people through difficult situations. And I thought at first I'd be a doctor. I was pre-med my whole life, devoted to that path. And then I found education was a better place for me to express all of those gifts that I have and hopes. And so the same is true for our students. I think if they get too locked in on one particular outcome, they might miss a huge possibility of a, of a joyful and successful life. I really want to ask your perspective and your clarification, if any. If I think high school students, do they really have enough time to develop self-understanding? Do they have enough time to dedicate themselves to learning about their passion, finding their new interests, 
and go into it. I only have to bend most of the time to fill the boxes, most of the time to repair for college admission. What do you think about that? Um, I think one of the great things about American boarding schools, and I, I can only speak most passionately about Suffield because I've devoted my whole career to this school, is uh, we're focused on academic excellence and on preparation for elite prestigious colleges, but we are fully focused on ensuring that this is a nurturing, supportive, encouraging environment. And that dictates the entire uh, flow of decision making at the school. It factors into which teachers we hire, into which families and students choose Suffield, because schools feel different. They have different priorities. And some are only, as you say, about academic rigor and percentage of students in the most selective schools. And ours tends to be more fulsome mm -hmm. in its approach. We're trying to achieve those two objectives of academic excellence and highly selective college admission in a unique way that takes very much into account adolescent development and adolescent psychology Mm -hmm. and understanding the forces that impact young women and men at different periods between 14 and 19 years old when they are populating our campus. The other strategy we take, and one key element in looking at American boarding schools, you can tell what a school values by how they spend time, because time is finite, mm -hmm. and time is king on these campuses. So Suffield sets aside time every day for its leadership program. It sets aside an hour for a community sit-down lunch with assigned seating. There are other ways we could use that time, uh, and some would say more efficiently in terms of academic preparation, but we're using those times to build a sense of community and um, health for our students and uh, faculty and, and the Suffield family. So. Uh, time, approach and philosophy, and last, um, Suffield is very intentional about its academic schedule. We have three 10-week terms. Mm -hmm. When we are in school, it is exceptionally busy. Saturday feels identical to Monday or Tuesday. It's school and sports, and it's full immersion in the life of the school, but that gives us 20 weeks where we're not in session. So students who are traveling far for March break or for the summer months, uh, mm. have that time to re-energize and come back totally focused on the many demands of academic life here. Yeah, so it means the school has been very well designing in terms of that's good break for the student to, to travel, to learn about the world and to revitalize themselves. But in the school period, it is a lot, a lot of things to do and it is very intense is it right? That's accurate. And there are th a few things we do to try to address that. One is physical activity for every student every afternoon from three to five. So mind, body, health. Mm -hmm. Second, good food. Good food, vital. Yeah. <laughs> Very important to our students. And what I've found in being ahead for 21 years now is the cost for the school between mediocre food and good food, not huge. And the impact, huge. Mm -hmm. So we have tons of options, vegetarian options, um, gluten-free options, great nutritious food, beautiful salad bar, beautiful deli bar, tons of nutritious options. If you don't like the main entree, they're wonderful things to eat. And that's, that's much more important than people realize, especially in a residential community. So we have a chance to experience this diversity of food today. Absolutely. Our, our, our land as a school, right? We'll get you in there. Yeah, no question. Okay. Um, we'll get you in there. I'm so, so happy to see all of you this evening and to have this chance to talk more about Kate School, a school that I have found to feel like home immediately. The second I stepped onto this campus, I 
I knew I was at somewhere special. And so I have decided to devote myself to education because I believe so deeply in the promise of young people, especially during these high school years, which we know are transformative years in terms of how young people understand themselves, what they know to be excellent about themselves, and when we care for them deeply, deeply in all parts of themselves, I firmly believe that we are setting them up for a lifetime of health, a lifetime of success, and a lifetime of contribution. And that continuity of care allows our students to be at ease, but also reach levels of achievement and understanding of themselves that is, that is surprising to them and delightful for us to watch. So I am thrilled that we'll be able to talk more about Kate today, and I can share more of my educational vision with you. I think uh, in, in further conversation, I would like to ask you more into about how to help the kids to understand best about themselves. Mm -hmm. How the learning journey design at, at, at cats? How is learning designed? Yeah, it's a great question. I think the most important thing to start with is the fact that we're a residential school. So, and what I mean by that is that their teachers are their coaches, our, their dorm parents, are their advisors, are going backpacking with them on the weekends. And so we see education is happening all day long. And in the classroom experience, we have a very unique approach here, which we call our inquiry method. And it's used across disciplines and for all four years, where we ask students to really focus on noticing first and then asking questions about what they notice and then making inferences about what they notice. And so we're training them in a process of inquiry that's very durable and very robust and serves them throughout their lives. So that's a, the classroom experience. In the classroom experience also, we are giving them real problems, like real questions to, to grapple with. It's not worksheets. It's not right answer, wrong answer. Sometimes a question doesn't have an answer. Sometimes we have to really grapple with lots of different ways of interpreting um, what might be true. And so we teach students to be comfortable with embracing that ambiguity, comfortable with their own ability to analyze and assess what a problem or question might be asking of them. And then in all the other aspects of school life, what we're able to then do is help them understand who they are and what might be getting in the way of a full, full expression of excellence. Maybe they feel nervous about making friends. Maybe they feel worried about that they have low confidence. And those things, when we can work on them outside of the classroom, really enhance the in-classroom experience so mm -hmm. that overall we have students who have really durable and robust and complete skill sets that set them up for incredible success in the world. Yeah, it, it means that the experience provided will be complex and yes. multidimensional. Yes. And so that can help the kids to understand better about themselves and can have different approach to uh, yeah. their life experiences. Yes. And it's not just themselves, but how does their mind work? What, are the, what, what resources are available to them? How, how do you respond when you don't know what to do next when you're writing an essay or solving a problem or, or even analyzing a lab? That, that we're giving them a sense of self that is multidimensional, as you said, and um, is unique to them. I think such kind of approach is very relevant for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because on the trip to the school, I, I read on the Oxford's website. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very impressed uh, with one certain uh, Oxford's quite like. They really want to see their students how they look at a specific subject. Exactly. Especially on the new thing. Yes. And, and this is the way for them to navigate towards the future, towards possibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is very important. Yes. And this is one of the most important criteria for Oxford to look for, yes. for their students. Yeah. I can feel that there's a big similarity between cats and building for the kids and what the top university like Oxford. Exactly. Looking for the future leader. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that the absolute top university, I mean, if, if it were as simple as getting really good grades, then everyone would get into the top universities. That is not the metric anymore. It's, it's about how, how students think, how they respond in the face of adversity, how they take what they know and apply it to make an impact in the world, how they are able to be vulnerable and accept feedback, 
contribute to the growth of others. It's those very dynamic, interpersonal, and durable skills that the top, top schools are looking for. And the good news is that's good for all of our students. I mean, mm. students who go to the Oxfords or the Harvards, but students who go to other schools as well. There's amazing schools here in this country all over the place. And so no matter where they go, we, are, we know they will be successful. For such a long-standing history school like Southfield, does the school have any unique characteristic that not be found anywhere else in the U.S.? A four-year leadership training program mm -hmm. that's embedded in the curriculum for every student. Because most schools are talking about leadership development, but they're not requiring it mm -hmm. for every student. And we are saying that leadership is about having a set of skills that lend themselves to having a positive impact on others in the world. It's that simple. It's not running a Fortune 500 company. It's not only. It's, it's being a positive member of your community, leading a healthy, well-adjusted life, and a, uh, being a good life partner. It's building these skills. So this intentional plan for leadership development, I think, is very unique to Suffield. And with our college counseling program, we looked at more than 300 programs around the country. Mm -hmm. And nearly all of them were starting from scratch in the middle of the junior year. And we felt that was leaving students at a disadvantage. So in ninth grade, while students are getting adjusted to this and we don't want them to feel tremendous stress about college, we do want to teach them what a cumulative grade point average means. What is a transcript? What does a college look like? So we take them on a couple visits of a, a major university and a small college. In grade 10, what is the difference between the ACT and the SAT? Mm -hmm. What does early decision and early action and restricted early action, what is this nomenclature that everybody's using in the process mean? What is our web-based software and how does it work? So once you're in the junior year and the intensity is ramped up, you have a firm foundation and you are well prepared in understanding what that looks like as you start to really identify which colleges and uh, areas of study most interest you. Because your school has a very unique program, like four years of compulsory leadership program. If, for example, for any Vietnamese student, when they come to the school at the grade 11, is there any big disadvantage they, they will face uh, if they try the school? That's an excellent question. So what we do is because we only have 10 or 12 new 11th graders, they have their own junior leadership class mm -hmm. where they essentially cover three years in one yeah. year. It's an accelerated, so the fall term, they're getting the whole ninth and 10th grade curriculum. Then, then in the winter and spring term, they're getting the 11th grade curriculum. And similar for new sophomores, they are in their own leadership classes and the ninth grade is essentially a reiteration, excuse me, the fall term is a reiteration of the ninth grade course. Does practice how long it is? Because I want to ask about how much experience about the school to onboarding the student at the later grade. Uh, that different entry points has lasted many, many years, certainly mm -hmm. well beyond my 30 years at the school. The leadership program is 20 years old. And that was a fascinating experience for a school to add a department because um, you subsequently have to subtract something. Mm -hmm. Time is finite and students only have seven periods in their academic day. So we had to add staff, we had to add new classroom space for that and we had to figure out how to fit it into the existing curriculum. It means the school syllabus will be arranged very flexibly and has a lot of modules for the student to attend, especially for the student who need additional classes, is it right? Yes, very discrete distribution requirements like four years of English mm -hmm. and four years of math and three years of science. These are non-negotiable, but credits from other high schools would transfer into Suffield. Mm -hmm. Any courses that students take after grade nine elsewhere would count toward the Suffield degree as well. I want to talk specifically uh, for Vietnam markets. They're on the credit will be fully transferable to your school? Yes. 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 So we'd need four years of English, two years of foreign language through level two, three years of science, uh, two years of history, including American history. So if mm -hmm. they haven't taken that, they can take that. 
here and four years of math. Mm -hmm. And then they would take a fleet of elective courses, at least one year of art and our leadership program. And then they could take elective courses across disciplines, science, math, technology. We have a bunch of computer science classes. Suffield also offers more than 22 AP courses. So in each discipline, we have a standard track, an honors track, and AP offerings. So there's a richness to the curriculum with more than 240 course offerings for only 400 students. It's, it's remarkable. Yeah, I think it's, 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 it's very impressive. I'm Charlie Can, the head of Suffield Academy. I've been the head of, since 2004, so this is my 21st year as head of school. What I'm most proud of at Suffield is the quality of the educational experience, which is highly rigorous and prepares our students for the most selective colleges and universities in the country, but also the atmosphere that is incredibly supportive and encouraging and each student is a key part of our success, our collective success. So Suffield has unique programs in leadership training that we'll hopefully discuss today and a four-year college counseling program. We've invested more than a million dollars in the facilities, which makes this a truly world-class campus. We have more than 200 people working here for our 420 students, so the amount and quality of individual attention for Suffield students is remarkable. So, we feel like we're part of something special that's nearly 200 years old, but is in many ways fully invigorated and new and energetic, and I'm very happy to share that with you today. How about the pressure? Is it designed for a huge or intense pressure for the kids to perform better, better, and better? Well, there's no question. They feel that pressure, and that pressure exists in the world. I mean, I feel that pressure. I want to perform extraordinarily well. I want to meet um, expectations. And I know that my success is also going to be due to how creative I can be, how resourceful and responsible I can be, um, how I lift up people around me to be successful. And so it's not just one thing. It's that, that pressure is real, but the way we respond to pressure is, is unique to us. And, and I have found that pressure is only motivating up to a certain point, and then it becomes demotivating. You know, yeah. At some point, it can cause someone to want to withdraw, to, to, to not bring their creativity and their gifts because they get nervous. And that's that's not productive learning. That's not the situation we want our young people to be in. We, as they're developing, we want them to have the right amount of pressure. And it, we certainly have very high expectations. I mean, we have so much pressure to even get into this school in the first place. And so we, what we want to do is take those very, very successful students and take them to the next level of performance. But the way you get there is not by pushing harder on them. The way you get there is saying, I believe in you. I know you can do this, and I'm going to help you get there. You mentioned 25 AP classes. Acro it's a, across disciplines, yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a really big number. It is. It's a really big number. Why? Why the school has developed that big portfolio of AP classes? Because we want um, our most talented, ambitious students to have all the opportunities they can to distinguish themselves. Mm -hmm. And college-level courses across disciplines is a great advantage for their growth and development academically and for their college aspirations. I do believe these diversified choices of AP classes will bring a lot of advantage for your student into college. Yes, the challenge is um, having students balance that with not being overwhelmed mm -hmm. and taking an array of courses that best does two things, um, meets their ability so that they're not overly taxed or overly stressed, and secondly, it gives them the best opportunity to earn the strongest possible grades they can. Mm -hmm. Because nothing is more important in the American college application process than that, the quality of that transcript, the grades on that transcript. Course rigor is certainly important, but we found in our experience that grades are most uh, important. Yeah, especially to the top school. Very high grade, if, if not say perfect grade. 
for yes. the SAT, for the critical AP. So I'm sometimes encouraging some of our students to take, at times, a less rigorous course to ensure a stronger grade. Yeah, but I wonder in that 25 AP classes, is there any more focused AP? Are there more that are rigorous than others? Yes, like uh, computer science, yes. uh, like uh, AI, calculus. or economics. There, there are some very popular AP required from the Ivy League and all the top schools in the US. Because there's a fleet of courses that robust, it gives each student a chance to distinguish themselves regardless of their background. Mm -hmm. So an Asian student may be more gifted in calculus mm. and higher level science because of their academic training than some students from other parts of the world. But uh, the beauty of our offerings is it gives that student a chance to distinguish herself or himself in a highly rigorous English-based course. An AP government, an AP US history, mm. an AP English. Whereas um, a domestic student may need to distinguish themselves in the most rigorous science, given that their whole educational experience has been in English. That makes sense. It means the diversity of, of students from uh, all over the world, uh, with different backgrounds, with different strengths, different standpoints, many different AP classes. Might, uh, might yeah. be a different answer for which is the most rigorous course, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, I, I have learned a lot from that. To be more specific, we, we're talking about the good side of pressure and the bad side of pressure. Mm -hmm. And an ideal school environment so, uh, like cats should be approaching pressure in a good way and to a good degree. So mm -hmm. that it should be motivating. Mm -hmm. So it's all about encourage the kids mm -hmm. that they can do that. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, is there any specific anchor or any specific focus? to build that pressure more positive than the normal pressure like How we can cultivate the kids' interest in intellectual? Mm -hmm. And uh, do we need to drive the kids to understand their passion or their specific interest in something? Mm -hmm. And from that passion, mm -hmm. from that curiosity, from that interest in learning more, mm -hmm. the pressure will become a good motivation for them to, to travel further. Mm -hmm. Is this the approach or anything else in, 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 in cat school? Yeah. Well, I don't think pressure is going away. Pressure exists everywhere from every single dimension. So we don't feel, and the, the biggest pressure is coming from our students putting pressure on themselves. So there's no lack of pressure. <laughs> if anything, what we're trying to do is help them learn to dance with that pressure, mm -hmm. to think about how can it motivate you? And if it's not motivating you, how can we quiet the pressure so that you can continue to perform at a really high level, like I've talked about? Like we. We wouldn't want a student to be sitting in their room alone thinking, I'm under so much pressure, I'm under so much pressure, and then not using all that time to think. You know, we want them to be taking their time to, to get better at what they're doing and get more skillful and nuanced at what they're doing. And so for some students, that pressure is not a big deal, and they can brush it off and, and focus. And for others, it can be more debilitating. And so there's not one one solution to it, um, but it's more about developing a relationship with pressure so that it mm -hmm. actually works for you, not that you're, you yourself are working to meet the pressure, if that makes sense. Very interesting about the relationship with pressure. Mm -hmm. So how we define that relationship with pressure? Mm. For all students or what I think an optimal relationship is? What's the, is the question about how, how I think it should be? Yeah, I would like to explore when we talk about uh, teaching the kids to dance with pressure, mm -hmm. to have relationship with, with pressure. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious. Mm -hmm. So what is that kind of relationship? Mm -hmm. And why they should have that relationship? Mm. Well, I think pressure can be very motivating. You know, I'm a competitive person. I was a competitive athlete my whole life. You know, I like winning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, and so that motivated me, for example. And that's true for a lot of our students as well. However, if that pressure gets to the point where you freeze and you can't perform, then the pressure wins. And you need to always be in a place where the, where the pressure is helping you win, not that the pressure is overtaking you, if that makes sense. And so, and it's different for each of our students. Some of them 
uh, thrive with that, with that sense of high standard that they want to meet, and it motivates them to work harder. And, and sometimes it doesn't. And so we, we have to be really careful that we're not too universal in one way or the other, that we're really responsive. And I think that's the beauty of a small school like Kate, is that we get to know our students and figure out, what's going to work for you? How am I going to get you to figure out your enormous potential? What is going to motivate you? What is going to get in your way? And that we get to work with you or any student in a really individual way to help them meet and exceed their own expectations for themselves, but it has to be a self-defined expectation. Can I ask whether four years of complementary leadership program is a very competitive weapon of subfield few students? It's also a great way to rebear the competitiveness of the student application from the school to the college. I think it certainly helps with the college process, but I think it helps far beyond that mm -hmm. in their life as a professional. The comfort, speaking in public, leading other people, understanding the dynamics of leading a team. It's, these are valuable life skills that most schools are not emphasizing. So each Suffield senior gets up in front of the whole school, all the students and faculty, and gives a talk. And it's a rite of passage here. It's a great source of confidence for our students. They're part of a tradition that's highly valued. It's, it's a very formative experience that probably would not unfold without this program. And are the students really engaged in the real-life projects at Southfield? I mean, uh, is there any kinds of project uh, related to community or related to the real-life challenges the students have the opportunity to be engaged with? Yes, at the school. it's a required part of the sophomore leadership program is an mm -hmm. off-campus off -campus. community service project. We have students working with the elderly and assisted living programs, tutoring elementary school students, working at local soup kitchens, working in various health organizations, homeless shelters around Greater Hartford and Springfield and our larger community and uh, understanding uh, what an incredible privilege they have to be at a school like this and the opportunities and obligations they have to help make the world better. The choices of what activity to engage is up to their interest or will be recommended by the school? It is chosen by each class. Mm -hmm. Each class votes and, uh. come and presents various opportunities for their classmates. And so each section in, in the sophomore class, there's eight or nine different sections of leadership with 11 or 12 students in each section. Each section pursues a different project. And then at the end, they each present to the entire grade on what they did. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask also about the relationship between subfield and the top university and college in the U.S. Do you have any strategic partnership or any kinds of annual or special activity with the top school in the U.S.? We certainly have um, schools that a large number of our students tend to go to each year. So mm -hmm. we certainly develop relationships with those schools. That is more complicated than it used to be because there's very high turnover mm -hmm. in the admissions office at most colleges and universities. So you'll have an admission officer recruiting our students for several years and then they move on to a different school or a different profession. So it's a little more challenging than it used to be earlier in my career, but there's no question that there are some schools that our students tend to apply to in, in larger numbers than others. We are also seeing a trend recently of our students uh, applying to larger universities. So we used to have many students applying to smaller colleges in New England, highly selective colleges, Wesleyan, Amherst, mm -hmm. Bowdoin, Bates, Middlebury, Trinity, those types of schools. Now we're seeing more and more students who want to go to big state and national universities like Michigan and NYU and Southern California and Virginia and Wisconsin and Boston University. And, uh, that just seems to be a trend where they see a lot of school spirit at those schools. They like the Division I sports, the breadth and scale of you can study any uh, subject or discipline with world-class resources. But my experience, having done this for 
a long time is these go in cycles and in waves. So we'll see, mm -hmm. we'll see what the next period of years brings. How about uh, the preparation of the school for the kids uh, to be admitted into the top elite university? Do you think that when we're talking about top elite, elite university, there's some kinds of common expectation, mm. some kind of in another world? Sorry, I, I, I don't want to use uh, that negative word, mm -hmm. but I want to put my question to an extreme level. Yeah. Is this kind of stereotype in terms of to expecting if you if you want to be the outstanding, if you want to be the leader of this generation, you have to perform exceptionally high across all the areas. Mm -hmm. I mean the academic SAT, AP, extra curriculum projects, mm -hmm. and also community projects. A lot mm -hmm. of things they have to deliver. Mm -hmm. So is this quite stereotype or is it putting too much pressure? Mm. on the kids and how the preparation are here for SCAC school to, to navigate the preparation for the student mm -hmm. in that situation? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Well, the first thing is that these schools are top schools, however you define them, are very good at reading applications. And what I mean by that is you could have everything correct on paper, but when you push a little harder, you realize it's not that authentic. You know, that the, if you talk to the students, they, there's a flatness about them. If they are doing things because they think they should do them, but it's not actually what they care about. Mm -hmm. And so it would be my nightmare for us to say to students, you have to do all these things you know, on paper and then actually not set them up for that success in the application process or beyond. And so what I'm saying is that it's the, it's the marriage between helping them be successful in all the metrics that you, that you shared, but also ensuring at every step along the way of their Kate journey that they are engaging with the challenges and they're engaging with the way that they want to spend their time and they're making the impacts in the way that they actually care about. Because if they don't really care, if they don't really care about science or math or whatever it is that they're trying to perform the best at, they're not going to be able to sustain their effort in that area. It's, a, it's, it's like if you hate running, you're probably not going to want to go running every day. They have to find something that they're intrinsically motivated by. And schools are, are paying attention to that. So what I'm saying is that we provide them lots of opportunities to learn and to perform at a high level. But we've also provide them with a lot of opportunities to discover and explore what really gets, gets them excited. Because we know that's what the universities care about the most. Yeah, so the first thing we have to is plans the intention behind such mm -hmm. demanding requirement. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is to connect their motivation towards these requirements, how they think, how they feel, yep. and how they approach. Yep. And the third thing is, do you recommend uh, that skip to have something uh, creative or something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. new to approach this school mm -hmm. to show more about their identity or their self-confidence? Mm -hmm. Well, what we hear so much from the, we, we have admissions office, we have 100 colleges come here every fall, and they love coming to this school because they know that when they're interacting with our students, they're interacting with really grounded, really present, really creative, really healthy, really resourceful kids who also perform well. And they love that combination. And I feel really confident that our model is, is exactly what colleges are looking for. But that's not why we run the school the way we run it. We, we deliver the best education because we think it's the best. And the outcome is that students have a wonderful range of choices at the end. But if we said from the very beginning, this school only exists to get you into college, we wouldn't actually deliver as good of a product. And so the outcome is a, a reflection on how good the experience is versus the other way around. Yeah. And there's a freedom in that. I, I really love the concept of liberal arts school because it's to encourage students to see the life, to see the world full of possibility. It, it's just like kind of a possibility. They can immerse in, in many ways, in many verticals, and then they can find their own passion and their own interest. And especially in today, we see it's not like 10 or 20 years ago when people just have one job or one career for their whole lifetime. 
But now the young people they can experience a lot of job, a lot of career within a lifetime. So it's it's really fascinating, and I, I I can feel that you have a big inspiration for liberal arts school. Yes. Is it right? It is right because I feel even if you pursue a, a career in science or math or business, the ability to ha read closely and write well and inspire other people is a key part of that. It's fundamental foundation that our students leave equipped from Suffield mm -hmm. with that um, sets them apart yeah. from most secondary school educational experiences. I'm curious, what is the trend of uh, liberal arts university in the U.S.? There's a significant decline in English majors mm -hmm. in, in America, which certainly is troubling to me. Why? But, Why? Well, Why? I think there is a greater focus on job placement mm. and on the investment, the significant investment that's required for a college education. There are important fundamental questions about the immediacy of earning potential and job placement and some skepticism that without a... Um, very specific angular degree, the ceiling is lower. Does it impact uh, a lot on the intention or the navigation of subfield in the next few years when the liberal arts school in the U.S. has been a significantly decreasing trend? I think that's reflected in our curriculum already by mm -hmm. the things we've discussed from the vast array of AP and elective courses that you can study anything here at the very mm -hmm. highest level that a that a secondary school can prepare you for. Yes, yeah, so, so it's, it will be subject to, to the kids' uh, interest and passion, and they can choose whether they can focus on the fundamental skill, and then they come to the college to immerse and to find a major later, and or they can also choose what major to focus, even in the school. Yes. Within the AB, AB choices. Right, and even if they are not an English major or a history major, they will still be required to take four years of English here. And, and this is a good segue to an important topic because some will say, well, with artificial intelligence and chat GPT, mm -hmm. why does a student need to learn a traditional yeah. five or six paragraph essay? So our, um, our, our pedagogy, our teaching methods are changing. So what we're seeing is students doing in-class writing of the five paragraph essay and then taking it and running it through ChatGPT on purpose. We're instructing them to do that, to see what artificial intelligence might come up with that's value added to what mm -hmm. they created. Instead of resisting the tool and telling our students not to use it, we want to find practical ways that it can make them even better students and better scholars. Why not on the other way? They, they... Because I don't want the technology to write the essay mm. for them. I want them to have the cognitive ability and the creative ability to, to craft their own thoughts and then use tools that will be readily available to them. We're just at the very beginning of this mm -hmm. to, to bring their work and inspiration to high, higher levels. We see your school is among the very rare school in the mm -hmm. U.S. Mm -hmm. who offer a, a beautiful range of mm -hmm. different areas for the kids mm -hmm. to engage, yeah. spark, environment, mm -hmm. acts. Mm -hmm. Especially, I know that SCAT mm -hmm. is very famous for the acts program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about that? About arts? Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, what I love about the arts, it's kind of like surfing, actually. There's a similarity. That it's really fun to be good at the arts, and it's really fun to be a beginner in the arts. Mm -hmm. And that's true about surfing, too. I just started surfing, so the reason I'm talking about this, if I'm just in the ocean, and I'm not very good, it's still wonderful, right? And so if you're learning how to sing, just singing in a group is so, it's so freeing. It, it speaks to that being a human, what's so amazing about to be a human. And so when a student is painting, making, doing ceramics, playing music, they are able to express a part of themselves. They're able to be playful. They're able to focus on skill. I mean, certainly every art requires a high level of skill, but it's a very integrated experience. And the, unlike, let's say, a math class or, or any class that has a right or wrong answer, there's no right or wrong answer with music or visual or performing arts. It's an expression of soul and of self. And so our students are especially good at the arts because we help them tune into who they are and what they want to say and give them all these different modalities to express that. Um, in their creative practice. I feel 
very grateful for the kids to study here. Oh. Honestly. Well, it's, I, I'm, I'm glad you can feel that because it's sometimes on our website in our materials, you'll see that there's a spirit. We talk about the spirit of this place. And that's not meant in a religious way. It's, it's that feeling you get about, wait, maybe I can just be myself. Like, maybe I can just ask the questions I want to ask and get help and talk to other people who are interested. And that is a beautiful thing. And, and yet we also pause. Everyone pauses to watch the sunset here almost every day because it's so beautiful. And so the pace of life is very human yeah. and very manageable and gives so much more space for deep, deep, deep learning and deep growth. And I feel so confident that anyone who comes to the school is touched by the school and changed by the school. I think I'm uh, one of the examples. Uh, <laughs> when I... Uh, have to uh, travel a long way to be here. Mm. I say, if I were the parents, I would not send uh, the kids <laughs> to uh, uh, such a remote area. It's so mm. far away. Mm -hmm. But when I, 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 I arrive at school, mm -hmm. my feeling changed. Yeah, exactly. And when I, I come into uh, this home, mm -hmm. my feeling changed again. Yeah. Very beautiful, aesthetics, yeah. and had a lot a good sense of art yeah. within the environment. Mm -hmm. And during the interview, mm -hmm. I can feel the fascination, the passion, the mm. connection, the emotion, mm -hmm. and your bride oh. at cat school. Oh. It, it, it's really transformed the feeling and the experience to the opposite yeah. person like me. Oh. Thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. It's such a pleasure to talk yeah. to you, and I'm glad to hear you have that feeling. But again, mm -hmm. at the house from uh, mm -hmm. Vietnam, I, mm -hmm. I still want to ask more mm -hmm. challenging questions. Please. <laughs> okay, this is a good thing. We, we help the kids to understand about themselves, to build up their crowded confidence mm -hmm. in a lot of areas. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we grow the kids in, in different disciplines, mm -hmm. not just uh, classroom experience, mm -hmm. for the real life project experience, mm -hmm. for sport, for environment, for mm -hmm. acts, and a lot of mm -hmm. things. But I wonder, mm -hmm. is there any area for the kid to feel that they are not good at and they can still be performing very well mm -hmm. at it? Because mm -hmm. life is not all the time competition. Yes, life right. is not all the time you have to excel, you mm -hmm. have to perform, mm -hmm. you have to win. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to do something you, you, you don't like. Yeah. But, but it's necessary. But yeah. it, it, it's essential yeah. because it will help you to learn some other things. Yes. It is even more important. Mm -hmm. Is it considered in the learning journey mm -hmm. at, at CAT school? Mm -hmm. And if yes, how oh. it designed once again? Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad you asked this question because I wouldn't want any of the audience to think that students come here and lie on the grass. In fact, there's a tremendous amount of structure here and there's extremely high expectations. And a lot of the things we ask our students to do aren't their favorite thing. You know, we tell them to wake up every morning, they have to make their bed every morning, they need to have breakfast every morning, they have to go to class, they have to go to sports, they have to go to study hall, they have to do a sport even if they don't want to do a sport. We, make the, we close the entire school for a week in September and everyone goes backpacking. Mm -hmm. And for some students, that's their dream, and for others, it's their complete nightmare. And that we help them through that. We have students who help with our composting, which is dirty and smelly and not necessarily something that they want to do. But the benefit of that is they really see how powerful it is when we treat our waste in a respectful way and that we get compost back out of it. Or we have students on kitchen crew who have to clean up the entire dining hall after dinner because it's like a family. You can't just live in a place and not contribute to a place. And so we have very high expectations. But you know what's amazing is that when the students are doing things that they don't necessarily love to do, they're often laughing, they're often singing, they're making jokes, they're ha and they're making the best of it. And that's life. You, know, you, you are asked to do things sometimes you don't want to do, but you have to make the best of it. And usually in those circumstances, that pause in their day, or if they don't want to go play sports, but they still go play sports, they actually come home happier, and they come home more ready for the next challenge. And so we're not asking them to perform just at an academic level all day. We are filling the day with lots of different kinds of experiences and, and that one usually fuels the other. 
and, and it ends up being a very demanding but also rewarding way to spend a day. Work, the beautiful. work never ends. <laughs> <laughs> but we do make them go to sleep, and I think that's important. You know, we know, we know we ask a lot of them, but the only way we can ask a lot of them is if they're well-rested, if they're well-fed, if they spend time outside. Um, and that's what sets them up for really performing and achieving and learning at such a deep level. Yeah. More specific into the AB classes, uh, we're talking that the AB classes of Southfield has been covering a very wide range of choices. But how about the level? I mean, for example, if my student interested in computer science and they want to take AB class even in the, the grade 9 or grade 10, so how they can further continue computer science in, in, in the next two years? For example, they would not be available, uh, allowed to take it in grade nine or ten. Mm -hmm. They need it, to meet foundational um, distribution requirements that we feel prepare yeah. them for that course. So a student is not taking BC calculus before they've taken regular calculus or honors calculus. Mm -hmm. There's a series okay. of okay. steps to get to the highest but level. But for some, for some AP, um, uh, it, for like computer science, is it included in the, the regular curriculum? We have a regular computer science course that we would generally ask them to complete before. Mm -hmm. Unless they come in grade 11 and they've already taken a foundation in computer science and our tech director, teacher, thinks that they can succeed in that course, we, have, we also have a, a three or four week drop ad period in the fall. So a student tries a course, realizes it's not challenging enough or too challenging, we can move around yeah. their course selections. Thanks a lot for your answer so far. I think that from, from, from the conversation, Vietnamese parents have much better understanding about the college admission, the college counseling, the trends in U.S. college now, uh, yeah, and also crack their curiosity and vagueness about the AP testing, especially because in Vietnam today, uh, when SIT has been removed from top U.S. college, and we were talking about AP, and there's an increasing concern and also worry about what, what, what are APs, how many AP classes my kids have to take, and it, it, how, how, how it's related to rebearing for their competitiveness into the college. I think your answers so far has been very detailed and very clear to them. Thank you. Thank you for that. You're welcome. And, and some schools approach this differently. We are seeing some American secondary schools remove AP courses and focus on mastery transcripts and other things that they think and they think will be helpful to the mental health and overall success of their students. We, we think that offering the most rigorous opportunities but having a fulsome approach throughout the life of our school to helping ensure the health and success of our students is a better strategy for Suffield. But I'm only leading one school, so the, <laughs> my decisions are only applicable for Suffield Academy. Yeah, so it means that for the student who want to apply to Suffield, they have to be ambitious and they have to be competitive to get through a very intense academic program, a lot of high expectations from the school. If their college aspirations are for the most selective schools, absolutely. Yeah. We have some room for some students who might not have that aspiration and still we feel enhance the quality of our community and can succeed here academically and personally, but for the profile of scholar that you are talking about, yes. Yeah. Um, fundamental academic ability and horsepower matched with ambition and a willingness to invest in the community, those are the ingredients required to be here. Very clear, Charlie. My last question is about what is your favorite thing or what is the thing you are most proud of at this school? Please choose one. Well, I'm most proud of um, what's unfolded here in the last 21 years that I've led the school. Um, the massive infrastructure enhancements that make this campus truly remarkable and world-class. But the steadfast commitment to a culture that blends rigor and um, 
community spirit and encouragement and valuing each child so dearly that that's timeless and the whole community, alumni, parents, students can all rally around that, that there's a sense of spirit and cohesion that really makes Suffield this very, very special place. So certainly I'm proud of our students. I'm proud of some of the buildings we've built. I'm proud of the scholars who have gone to the Ivy League and the most selected schools. But what I'm most proud of is that we've made this unique place so much more sustainable. And I'm confident 190 years, some people are gonna be, uh, from now, some people yeah. are gonna be sitting up here talking about uh, Suffield and its approach to adolescent development and education, so. When I walk into the, uh, the school uh, this early morning, I can feel there's something special about the school, especially about the bride, because I see that there are a lot of recognition, a lot of appreciation and tribute to the people who have contributed here. This is the tree in the memory of someone. This is a statue in the memory of someone. This is school yeah, in the memory of someone. Yes. And, 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 and this is very particular in the subfield. Yes, and this motto, Esse Quam Videri, which means to be rather than to seem. Mm -hmm. And it means being genuine and lacking pretense and being real and focused on the destiny of each young woman and man here. That's, that's what we're proud of. Is, this is not just about status and elitism. This is about the essence of helping young people navigate adolescence and prepare to be healthy, successful adults. I have finished on the critical question. I just want to ask you one more question. Very aside question. For on the school, when we ask about where we can do the broadcast, the main choices are the head of school office or the admission office, only subfield to, to this venue. What's the reason for that? We felt this was the best venue for this interview, and we feel the work that you are doing is vitally important. So we want to give you our very best, and if that means we have to move a class for today or do things that we wouldn't ordinarily do. What you're doing is very important. You're going to open a market in Vietnam to these incredible opportunities, not just at Suffield Academy, but at these incredible, remarkable schools in America. So we're trying to send a message to you and all of the people watching that this is vitally important and Suffield is deeply proud and honored yeah. to be part of this. So, Whatever space we thought was the best is what you, what you, what you got. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah, we, we really uh, appreciate uh, the dedication and the arrangement and the appreciation and the expectation you have put in on towards our show. And I also believe that this series will provide a lot of perception changing thoughts, new perspective for Vietnamese parents and students. And and I wish that someday uh, Vietnam, our old countries, will have such quality high school like U.S. And, and, and it would be amazing. From our conversation, I firmly believe that CATS and Subfield are exceptional schools for children to try given the opportunity. Their insights are incredibly valuable for our audience, particularly for Vietnamese parents who might gain a fast perspective on educational expectations. I trust you will send that enchantment, passion, connection, emotion, and pride this school instill, leaving you inspired by the profound impact they can have on the student. Thank you, Ms. Alex and Mr. Charlie. This is Z. I'm the founder and CEO of FindingSchool.com, a Boston-based educational search engine that connects thousands of U.S. and Canada private schools with over 1.6 million users globally. So founded about 13 years ago, the Finding School mission has always been to help the parents to get access to first-handed, unbiased, and up-to-date information regarding the U.S. boarding school experience. The information, we think, can help them to better understand how the system works here 
and also the individual school's requirement. All of them are going to help them to make a better, more well-informed decision, which we think is one of the most important decisions in their lives. And the finding school is going to continue to provide more service beyond that, just for your information. We truly believe in that. K-12 U.S. boarding school education is something that Vietnamese parents is currently looking for and very interesting. That's why we are in the collaboration with Ms. Hangbo's team from EDU Station and Vesetra. That's why we team up for this special U.S. boarding school edition podcast. It's the first of its kind going abroad study industry in the Vietnam. The whole goal here is trying to demystify the true boarding school experience in the U.S. Together, we travel all the way from Vietnam to the United States, covering more than 35,000 kilometers by air and more than 1,500 on the road to make it a reality for you. We visit 10 top boarding schools on the West Coast in Los Angeles area and on the East Coast, Boston and New York regions. And we conduct many in-depth conversations between our host, Mr. Hong, and head of schools share the story from current and the formal Vietnamese students and also filmed a lot of school highlights that will really speak to the characteristic of the school. Thanks for watching this episode and I hope you really enjoyed this. And this is just the beginning. We are continuously to roll out more service and activities that can really help Vietnamese parents and the students for their lifelong journey at top U.S. boarding school. Thank you.